Hey, this is Maurice Joseph from Net Lake, Minnesota, and you're listening to Native Americano, hosted by Keith Sokola. Maurice, I always start off my interviews. I've been telling people, you know, back on the Iron Range, I um, bought a 67 Newport uh, big car, you know, after high school graduation. I think the teacher wanted to give it, help me out. I was going to college. But in the trunk, I found this uh, transistor, and the, the car got, was hit by a bear, and it had bear power in it. And uh, a shaman owned this car for a while and became a magical transistor. Like if you put the, a seashell to your ear, right, you'll hear the ocean, they say. Yeah. So this, you'll put it to your ear and you'll hear Maurice Chosa on a Native Americana radio off the dial, kind of. And so you're a guest today and, and I see your dog too, Code. Good to yeah. see you guys. Welcome. Yeah. Tell us who you are. Okay. Uh, I'm Maurice, Mo Chosa, Maurice Chosa. Net Lake Band member here in northern Minnesota. Uh, I'm an 80 year old Marine vet. Spent a good number of years traveling around backpacking. Uh, and as I told you earlier, you know, I walked across Idaho and actually part of Montana barefoot, uh, partly to see if I could do it and also to strengthen my connection with Mother Earth, see what kind of lessons I could learn. And uh, I've learned to walk softly. And well, you saw that when we were hiking in, uh, what was I wearing on my feet in, in, uh, out there in the desert? I'm wearing beach sandals, you know, no problems. What I've kind of learned is that, in a sense, that Mother Earth will take care of you if you, you take care of her. And uh, it's part of the spiritual process. And, and, and so this song, uh, Soar Like an Eagle, is kind of a a uh, compilation of my experiences and the things that I've learned uh, dealing with Mother Nature and dealing with people and what I've seen, the changes that have come and gone. And what I ask is that people make this trip that I'm talking about in the song symbolically. <laughs> Soared like an eagle and cooed like a dove, roamed like the lobo o'er this land that I love. The rights of my brothers are written above. These are some things I do not think too lightly of. I've traveled this country for half a century. I wish I could share with you all that I have seen. I've climbed the high mountains and been shore to shore, crossed the great deserts and seen so much more. The earth is our mother. She takes good care of us. She does it so willingly and seldom makes much fuss. But now she is aching and I'm sure I've heard her cry. The answer's within you, but you must learn why. You must soar like an eagle and coo like a dove and roam like the lobo or this land that you should love. The rights of your brothers are written above. These are some things you should not think too lightly of. In my travels, I've learned so many things. I've learned about what love and what heartbreak can bring, but the things that bring my heart the most distress is how people hate each other and they love their mother less. The two-legged, four-legged, and the winged two all came from the same mother. I know that this is true, so treat all brothers kindly and with due respect and the answer will come to you 
put on this. You must reflect. You must soar like an eagle and coo like the dove and roam like the lobe o'er this land we all love. The rights of our brothers are written above. These are some things we should not think too likely of. Now I'm growing older and soon will be history. I lost my vision. I don't like what I see. We've lost our connection to nature and the land. Our ways are like a house of cards that is built on sand. People get together and hear our Mother Earth, the Creator will soon judge you and reveal your worth. You must change your ways and let others be free before it's too late and you have no destiny. I've soared like an eagle and I've cooed like a dove. I've grown like the low or this land that I love. The rights of my brothers are written above. These are some things I do not think too likely of. You know, like the eagle in many cultures is, is a symbol of freedom. It's also a, a symbol of uh, vision, being able to to see far beyond what uh, beyond the end of your nose. You know, uh, and so that's what I want people to do: is quit looking beyond that to the end of your nose and look around and see what's happening. The dove is an international symbol of peace and love, and that's something we need to to. Uh, to regain, we've got too much hate in this country. Uh, and the wolf is a guide for for many of the uh, the, uh, the native peoples. It's a, it's a symbol of, of strength, of being strong, uh, sticking to your values, and 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 leading you to some uh, the place you need to be. So if we can. You symbolically take the trip with the eagle and look around and, and feel some love and, and quit hating on each other and, and let, let our spirit guide us to the, to the proper places. I think we'll be a whole lot better off. And that's what this song is about. Uh, it's a, for me, it's a spiritual and symbolical trip. Yeah, the symbolism, the metaphors are, are fantastic and, and your voice is right on a form for an 80-year-old Marine. It just sounds great today, Maurice, and your Thank inspiration, you. you know, I know that you spent some time in the wilderness in the Superstition Mountains. One of my best times was when we and you went out there last year and you bought that new four-wheeler and went up that road and we hiked well, all the way down the road and you just kind of patiently said, you could go hiking a little bit, you know, come back in an hour. And yeah. uh, it was a great day, Maurice. And Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've, I'm treasuring that those memories and those photos that we got. Uh, you know, the, the, too bad we didn't get some uh, video going up the hill, but uh, people look at that uh, going down the hill and all of a sudden that front end drops out of sight, you know, whoa, I get that kind of a reaction. Because, yeah, that was pretty rough ground. But, yeah, you know, it, uh, what it is, is, um, uh, you know, I know your songs and uh, they're stories, they're history stories, like John Bear Grease. Talk about that one. Oh, yeah, John Bear Grease. Uh, you know, back in the 1800s, the late 1800s, uh, was pretty instrumental in, in developing the, the North Shore to economy. He, he delivered the mail for almost 20 years and nobody else could. And he had a dog sled team. He was uh, uh, Nishinaabe from up there at, uh, uh, okay, brain fart here. <laughs> the Grand Portage area? Grand Portage, from the Grand Portage area, yeah. and. Uh, yeah, he was, uh, you know, one of you know the dog sledding was was a, was a fairly big deal amongst uh, the Anishinaabe people. And my grandfather was running dog sleds about the same time up here in the Boundary Waters. Uh, it wasn't the Boundary Waters then, of course, but uh, uh, 
the, you know, trapping lines or getting into town to get uh, uh, supplies or whatever. You know, my mother uh, did the same thing, you know, ran a dog sled to go get supplies in town. And when she was only like eight years old, uh, but yeah, he was, uh, uh, his four dogs, he never had more than a four dog team. And, and you know, he would deliver mail along his trapping line you know, and, and pick a few extra dollars that way. And an interesting uh, sidelight to this whole thing is that right now they're running, uh, or back when they ran all the way up to Grand Portage, the 500 mile run there, the, the, the time that it took from the from uh, Grand Portage to uh, 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 Twin Ar uh, yeah, Two Arbors there, he did it in the same time with, with four dog team and a hundred pound sled as the guys do now with a 12 dog team and a, and a 30 pound sled. Uh, and it's, uh, you just had, you know, Indian dogs. No. It's, it's all in the as song it too. It's all in a, a three, four minute song. That's a song, yeah. Yeah. And thanks it's, for uh, doing that work. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was, uh, it was, that was one of those songs that just kind of hit me where uh, I was, uh, Part of a uh, the initial uh, uh, council to set up the the race in Ely, uh, and we were talking about. It, and the guy, one of the guys who was helping us out, he was on the bear grouse on the bear grease uh, committee, and uh, we talked about that. So I asked him to send me some history on that, and he did. And then, boom, that song just kind of came to me. Only two chords, but uh, you know, it works, I guess. How about? Um Sakaji we got Vicky Kwe. Oh yeah, my uh, great grandmother. Yeah, she was uh, back in the 1800s. She was about 16 years old, so that would have been probably about 1880. Uh, she was uh, kidnapped by some uh, uh, a band of marauding Eskimos that came down off uh, uh, Hudson Bay, looking for whatever they could get, particularly women, to take back up to their village. And they wound up, uh, they kidnapped two, uh, two young ladies, one of whom was my, uh, my great-grandmother. Uh, the other uh, lady, she didn't, uh, she didn't want to go, so she, apparently what she did is she tied her knife to a sapling, broke it off, and then jumped on it with her chest and, and stabbed herself on, the, on that knife, so she committed suicide because she didn't want to go back up there. And Sakaji uh, uh, uh decided she was going to live. And, and so she went along with the program and went up there. And they, they sold her up there to an older man, you know, to, uh, for, as to be a wife and take care of everything, a slave kind of a thing. And she was up there for a couple of years, had two children. And uh, as the story goes, uh, some uh, young friends she made, uh, they gave her a uh, a boat, probably a little skin boat of some kind, you know, they, not too many different kinds of crafts that they did have, but she loaded up what she could, took her two kids and escaped. And then paddled up one of the little creeks someplace as far as she could go, broke the boat up into little pieces and hit it and then took off overland. And she spent all summer and, uh, well, she started out in late spring and all summer and into late fall uh, trying to get home. And she finally made it to this one river bank and couldn't go any farther. Children that died of starvation. I mean, the oldest one couldn't have been more than a year, year old, and the uh, the youngest one was just a baby. And without food, you know, she get you breastfeed, and she didn't have any more milk for him, obviously, you know. And she was skin and bones. They say when they found her, but she collapsed on this river bank, and lo and behold, one of her cousins came paddling up the river. And uh, so she held up her arm, she had enough strength to hold up her arm and wave at him. The guy came over and, ah, you know. So she was saved. And she spent all winter, you know, laying in bed, you know, recovering from that. They gave her a warrior's name, Sagaji uh, Gabuik, which means walks up the hill. And that basically, in a symbolic way, denotes a really tough road to, to travel, you know. And uh, she made it. And, uh, you know, she's, I guess, subject of quite a little bit of uh, lore and stories up in Canada where she went through, but she apparently did it, as she said, without any help from anybody. 
she hid from everybody because she didn't want to get captured by anybody and then sent back up to that old man again. She wanted to come back to home and, and, and be free. And uh, freedom is so important to us as, as, as Native peoples. Uh, if we don't, you know, fight for our freedom, what are we? Then we're going to be prisoners locked up in a, in a land that uh, used to be ours. Uh, and, you know, it, it's all in that song, too. Um, some of my favorite songs, like, uh, here is a story about a Michigan champ. Now, tell me about this one. <laughs> oh, the Michigan champ. Yeah, that's, that's my grandfather. And uh, he came, now he followed the old tradition in getting married. And in the old days, the, uh, what you had to do if you wanted to get a wife, if you're a man needed a husband, you had to leave your village because everybody in your village was related to your mother. The band was your mother. We're a uh, matrilineal society, not, not uh, uh, we don't, you know, I'm my mother's son, I'm not my father's son. He didn't do any work, you know. Mom did all the work having me. So anyway, you had to leave your band so that uh, you uh, didn't marry somebody who was related to your mother and you had to go to another village and then you had to find somebody who was in a different clan because everybody in your clan is related to your father. Uh, and that's how the, the male line was, uh, was carried on was through the clan, whether it be loon clan or sturgeon clan or uh, uh, fisher or what have you. Everybody in, the, in, that, in that clan is related to, to their father. And all the meals are related. So that's what he did. He came from Keweenaw Bay, Bay, Michigan, and uh, uh, married uh, my grandmother, who was uh, in, uh, in a little village on Basswood Lake. Uh, and uh, Clara Defoe was her name. And so uh, he went, uh, as my uh, grandmother, or my, uh, my oldest aunt told me, he paddled up to the village and he wanted to come courting, you know, and he brought some gifts and he went up and he was talking to the parents, you know, and he, he, he wanted to, uh, to know if, you know, they, you know, they consider letting, you know, Clara be his wife, you know, and, and so they, they said, yeah, we'll, we'll tell her, we, they couldn't find her, they looked around, they couldn't find her, she was gone. I said, well, we'll tell her when, when she comes back that you, you want to take her for her wife, his wife. Of course, that she's got the right to say no if she chooses to. So they walked him back down to the canoe landing, and there she was, already packed up, had her stuff in the canoe, waiting to go. <laughs> <laughs> and she was about 16, too. I mean, that's when, when the ladies got married, you know. And I ain't waiting around, you know, let's, let's do it. The, the, uh, the priest will come around later on and make it legal, so that's what they did. And they, uh, uh, they, they lived on a couple of different islands on Basswood Lake before they finally... Uh, uh, settled in on, uh, on on Hoist Bay, but uh, that's you know, a story. I mean, he was a professional prize fighter back in Michigan in the day, and so when he got down here, he was known as the Michigan champion. He didn't mess with him, and he was about. This is in the song also, but when he was about sixty years old, my mother told me this story. That uh, Grandma was out there on the at the uh, the boat landing, uh, and. Uh, where they used to take pictures and sell pop. And somebody wanted to take her picture, you know, and so she turned around and put her hand out like this, you know, with, you know, like put some money there and then they'll take, they'll let her take their picture. <laughs> but anyway, she was out there, they were doing their thing and this guy called her, a, called her a name. Mom didn't say what it was, but probably something like a dirty old squaw or something like that. And grandpa went up and demanded an apology and apparently the guy who was a local roughneck, uh, I call him a lumberjack in the song just because it, it kind of fits, but he may have been. But anyway, he basically told grandpa where he could go, so grandpa hit him one time. And that was about noon, and he didn't get up off the dock until after supper. Uh, Mom said he was fried to a crisp, laying there flat on his back, stretched out in the sun all afternoon. Uh, you I wonder don't... if he was squabby at all, probably. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that's kind of his story, you know. That, uh, it's a good story, Maurice. So all your songs, you know, you, you, you concise them down. Uh, this is what I learned from your song here. Uh, tell the people what Toe the Line is, because that's one of your lyrics in Michigan Champ. 
Oh, yeah. That goes back to the old uh, uh, bare knuckle boxing days where uh, when you were getting ready to, to do your fights, there wasn't any dancing around in the ring. You, you, they would draw a line in the sand or the sawdust or, or whatever it was where you were going to fight. They would draw a line there and you put your toe up on that line. And there you stood toe to toe. And then when the signal went, you went to it. And you didn't move that toe. If you move that toe off of there, you, that was considered like a knockdown. So you got to stay right there and, and just wail away. And when you got knocked off that line, they gave you 10 seconds to get back up to that line. Now, if you actually got knocked down, they would give you again that 10 seconds. But a, a, a knockdown would end, would end the round, and you could have a minute to recover, sit on your scooter or whatever, and you go back and you would toe the line again and go to it. To illustrate how tough some of these old farts were that did this, there are fights on record going over 150 rounds. So, you know, somebody got knocked down a hell of a lot or two somebody's, you know, 150 rounds before it was over with, you know. Some of the old traditions are still present in boxing, like the 10 seconds, you know, and all that. But toe to toe, I mean, that was mano a mano. There was no dancing around, uh, none of this Floyd Mayweather, Floyd Mayweather stuff, you know. You just went to it until it was over. <laughs> and, and you know what, um, we did the longer version, Maurice. We have some great interviews and on the longer version of Native Americana, um, the more of the stories and detail and things are there, you know. We just want to visit today and kind of catch up with you. How are you doing during this time? Are you keeping busy? Keeping, you look good. Oh, I'm doing great. Yep, yeah, I'm uh, gaining a little weight, a little too much, but you know, we'll deal with that. Uh, I want to keep it down around where I was when I got down to Arizona last, last winter. Uh, right around 130 pounds. That way it's not too much stress on my legs and I can still walk and go places with Cody. And uh, yeah, I've been, I've been toying with another song idea. It's, uh, I haven't really had anything come to fruition yet, but uh, I, I had a fall on the ice this, this winter and really wrecked my left hand so I couldn't play guitar for about five months. Uh, and it's still kind of sore if I play for more than 15, 20 minutes, and then it gets really sore. I, I tore a bunch of ligaments, I guess, in the hand. Uh, Maurice, how do you, Maurice, how do you write a song? Do you pick your topic and start writing from it? Or like you just said, you were inspired. Is that where it starts? Inspiration comes a couple of different ways. Sometimes I'm, I'm, I'll sit and play and just do a progression of chords and try to find different chord progressions, different rhythms, and all of a sudden something will fall into place like, that could be a song. And I'll play that for a while and I'll think about different things. And sometimes the, the, the poem itself will come to me first. You know, the, the lyrics will come before, the, before I actually have a song. It's uh, very seldom does it, it happen together. Uh, one of the few times was my, uh, uh, that song, uh, Hey Mister, you know, about sitting around a campfire and the guy do not you know, we're all kind of raggedy, you know, and, you know, <laughs> I did that song for you, didn't I? Yeah. Hey, Mr. Yeah. If you want to play it, you got your guitar, play it. Give us a bar, a couple measures there. Could you? You free as a bird, blah, blah. Anyway, that's the one that it just came to me in about five or six minutes. I had the song, you know, tuning the whole thing, sitting around a campfire. But yeah, it, it varies. It's uh, sometimes uh, the, the words will fall into place for me and I'll write a, I'll write a series of lyrics and then, uh, I'll have a tune and I'll, I'll sit there and things will kind of fall into place for me. It's just not having a background in music and knowing how to actually write music or anything like that. It's just kind of catch as catch can as, as, as inspiration hits. And then, then you write it down, your words, and or I, I've seen some, you, you have a little cassette recorder or something or yeah. a voice yeah. recorder. Yeah, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll practice different things, see how that works. You know, sometimes, sometimes it all falls together right away, and sometimes it's just a matter of piecing things together. Oh, this works with that. Uh, some, some songs might take a couple of years. Some songs, like I say, I wrote one in six or seven minutes. Uh, a few songs I've written, you know, in an hour or two. But mostly it's, uh, it's trial and error, and uh, it's trying to stay within whatever the inspiration is. Uh, uh, the stories that I tell, I, I, uh, the songs that I write are 
are not fiction. There's no fiction. There may be a little uh, creator's license, so to speak, you know. Yeah. But it's all uh, based on fact and. Uh, like a lumberjack instead of a, yeah. And it's, you know, for the most part, it's, it's my personal experiences or my family's experiences or something, you know, like uh, I'm not directly related to John Bear Grease, but my grandfather was a, uh, was a dog sledder and they were contemporaries in a way. And, uh, and I thought his song, his, his story needed to be told uh, to music, which I hadn't, hadn't heard anything. So it, uh, that came to me fairly quickly as well, as, as it was, you know, like some of the others. That was a song I think it took me maybe a week or so to put together. It was the John Bearbury song. Well, you're a uh, true Northwoods troubadour. And I think that's your monker there, hey, Maurice? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Campfire like that. Yeah. 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 And like, a lot of my life has been spent in the wilderness. I grew up up on Basswood Lake. Uh, one of my early memories was walking down the four mile portage a little ways and seeing two deer come out of the woods on this game trail and then walked a little farther and then two police dogs came out of the woods and they, they looked at me and they went down the trail following the deer. And, so I got up on the trail and I followed them for a ways. I went home and grandpa was sitting on the, in his rocking chair on the porch there. And I climbed up in his lap and told him about the, the two deer and the two police dogs. And uh, like grandpa's do, he <clears throat> rubbed that beard over my face. And, and he said, oh, them's not police dogs, them's just wolves. You know, <laughs> the attitude was, you know, mother nature will take care of you, don't worry about it. You know, wolves are no problem. You know, if anybody, if a wolf was ever gonna eat a kid, there I was. I'd have run up to them if they came towards me. I'd have go pet, I'd go pet them, you know. You got no interest in me. Uh, people have such weird ideas about nature and, and how it's, you know, it's so bad. You know, there's all kinds of things out there going to hurt you. Yeah. You treat Mother Nature, you treat the Earth with respect, you know, they respect you back. And I've, I've never had an issue. I've never been lost in the woods anywhere. And I've roamed from the woods up here in northern Minnesota, the Sawtooth Mounds in Idaho, the uh, Sierras, the, the Superstitions, uh, Colorado Rockies. A lot of times, no map, no compass. Go where I want, come out where I want. Never been lost. Been lost in the town many, many a time, you know, but <laughs> never in the country, you know, never out there in the, in the boonies, you know, and it's, uh, I, I attribute that to the, the teachings of my grandfather and, and, and being one with the earth, being one with Mother Earth, you know. Uh, learning to walk softly and, and treating, you know, sure, I'll, I hunt, I fish, but when I, take my, when I take my game, I pay my respects, I put down my tobacco, I thank the spirit of, of the creature that you gave himself to me as, as a gift for my needs. Uh, and from the time that I developed that that philosophy, I've never missed a meal that wasn't intentional. I've done my fasting, but those are the only times I've ever missed a meal that uh, that I needed to miss. I mean, I've never had a problem with it. And uh, oh, well, you know, thanks for visiting with us today and presenting the Anishinaabe point of view, and I know you're a survivor. You survived polio when that came around. Tell us a little bit about that. What was that like? And was it something similar? Yeah, I was, I was, I was at the, uh, the, board, the Brainerd Indian Training School in Hot Springs, South Dakota. It's a mission, uh, Wesleyan uh, Baptist, Wesleyan Methodist uh, Mission School. And I come down with polio there. I, my, my back of my neck was sore, so they took me in. And that was back when we were having a, a 52 uh, when we were having the, the polio epidemic. And uh, they took me in and uh, gave me uh, the spinal test, you know, spinal tap, and yeah, okay, he's got polio. So I was in isolation for 11 days and I just lay there in bed. And then on the 11th day, I tried to stand up. Couldn't do it. Could not get up off my butt. Uh, and uh, at that time, the uh, doctor was talking to my mom because uh, I wanted to greet mom when she came in. I wanted to stand up and meet mom when she came in to visit me. and. Uh, uh, they were sitting at my door at the uh, at the, uh, the hospital, 
and the doctor is telling my mom is you know someday he'll learn to walk but not without a limp he'll never be an athlete uh, well that's what he told my mom he didn't tell me that uh, cut a long story short uh, yeah, I was a three-sport letterman at, in, at uh, Pine Ridge, South Dakota, the Ogallala Community High School, uh, set uh, track records all over Western South Dakota, uh, played football in, in Marine Corps, you know, uh, uh, ran a 4.49 mile at the age of 45, ran a 2.08 uh, half mile at the age of, you know, a 34 minute 10K at the age of 45, you know, okay, never learned to walk, never be an athlete, okay. The point of that being is don't ever give up. Don't, don't let somebody tell you what you can't do. You know, do what you got, do, give it your best shot. And that's, that's also embodied in my song uh, that I write about uh, uh, Spirit of the Wolf. My, do my dogs are too slow to win a race. You know, they don't have any business being in that race. <laughs> you know, and when I perform that one for the kids, I tell them that same thing. Don't ever let tell you something. Nor, don't ever let somebody tell you you can't do something for whatever reason. Give it your best shot. You may surprise yourself. You know. And that's uh, um, some good good uh, words to teach and leave um, our people and really respect you, um, Maurice, as a elder, as a Anishinaabe elder, a Boys Fort member, a Marine. Uh, headbands off to you, my friend. Some good ones, Maurice. You're like a professional. <laughs> <laughs> I learned a lot from you. Yeah, watching. Well, good. What, with a great, you. what a great visit today, and uh, you know, like uh, Saul and George will package it, so it'll make it look really nice, and we'll get that video. I think. Yeah. Look at this background, Maurice. The, oh, yeah, the, yeah. But uh, uh, well, that looks familiar. <laughs> yeah, we hiked out there. Yeah. And then I got a cool one up there too. Like you'll probably recognize this background. Oh yeah, there's Spirit Island even. Yeah.